Ready? Hello, hello. My name is Hannibal Taboo, and uh, I'm doing a presentation today called The David Blake Rule, Comic Book Industry Economics for Creators of Color. Uh, very briefly about me, I am a columnist for a website called Comic Book Resources. Uh, I write a column there called The Bipow, which reviews comics uh, every week on Thursdays. I also won the Top Cow Talent Hunt in 2012 and wrote Artifacts number 35 for Image Comics, which is the same company that does Walking Dead. That's what most people remember. Uh, also, I have to say this earlier. I talk way too fast, so if at any point during the presentation, if you see me and I'm talking too fast and you can't keep up, just wave both of your hands over your head really wide, and I'll be like, oh, I should probably slow down. Okay, okay, so. Uh, Top Cow Talent Hunt. I also write the Aspen source books for Aspen Comics, and I have two prose novellas coming out from them in 2016. And I write uh, the Wasso prose novellas for Stranger Comics, which is a, a black-owned fantasy company. And I'm going to be talking basically about, well, a multiple of things. But the gentleman you see on the uh, screen is David Blake, and we'll be talking about his rule, which I and how I believe it applies to comics. So we all we all together. We all ready to roll? Yeah. Fantastic. All right, here we go. So. <clears throat> This is uh, the basic object, uh, agenda of what we're going to be doing today. Uh, we're going to discuss what the Bla David Blake rule is, how much creators actually make. Can you make that much? Like, right now, can that happen? Uh, what the definition of done is, and building your brand and competing in the market. So that's the general overview of what we're doing. People are going to come in late, and I'll have to probably flip back to the slides. Sorry. Hopefully not. We'll see. Um, OK. The David Blake rule is, as uh, stated on the song, if it don't make dollars, it don't make sense. Because I love comics. All of us love uh, different things. We're passionate about things. But this is a business. You know, They're not putting out Spider-Man because, yay, we want to help the world and have more Spider-Man. They don't care about that. They want to make money. Uh, and one of the things, and this is one of the notes I had while I have this up, uh, the first black editor in comics was a gentleman named Christopher J. Priest. He uh, worked at Marvel in the 70s. Uh, he was, for many, many years, the only black person who had ever written for a big two comic company. And he talked uh, very extensively about knowing the difference between art that is for the sake of art and art that is just for the sake of commerce. Art that you make for art's sake, you can do in your house. You can put it up the way you want. You can have no oversight. You can figure out whatever you want to do with it. Uh, but art that is for commerce has to sell to other people. So they have to find something to like in it. So you have to be able to connect with them. And that discordance, because people say, oh man, what's with this Wolverine book, man? I could write a way better Wolverine book than that. Can you? Really? Are you sure? Are you the person, because the editor on that book, he's got a job right now. People pay him because they expected him to do the job. And he's doing it. Can you make his job easier? If you put, they put your name on that book, will it sell more copies to retailers? Honestly, probably not. But <laughs> I know it's true with me. My name won't do it. But uh, unless you can do those things, unless you can make money for the publisher, unless you can make retailers order the book, because that's a tricky part in comics. Comics are essentially uh, a monopoly uh, to the point where, at one point, the Department of Justice investigated a company called Diamond Comic Distributors for what are called Sherman antitrust violations. Then a new administration came in. They were a little more friendly to money, and that case went away. So <laughs> doesn't mean they weren't guilty. It means they weren't prosecuted. And you know, I'm black. I can respect that. I'm not mad about that. <laughs> so uh, the question, the, the next question goes into how much creators actually make. Uh, a artist named Megan Hetrick shared something on a website called Bleeding Cool about her actual financial picture. She broke down how much she makes on a book, how much she makes per page, how much she spends, yada, yada, yada. After taxes, she makes about $30,000 a year working 12 hours a day, six or seven days a week. Okay? Now, if you live in, you know, I don't know, Montevideo, that, that might be enough money for you. I mean, in certain parts of the United States where that might be enough money. I live in LA. <laughs> and, you know, most of the comics in the world are made in Oregon and New York and California. That's where most co comics and, you know, the 70% of the comics market, that's where they come from. So, actually, with Ani and Dark Horse, it'd be a little more than 70%. But anyway, 
That is, uh, so before she gets health insurance, because health insurance costs, you gotta help, have health insurance, you work a 12 hours a day. Uh, before she pays for the art supplies to actually do her job, before any of that, she makes $30,000 a year after taxes, okay? And she works on DC Comics, she's worked on big things, she's broken in and works as a full-time artist on uh, one, what they call the big two companies. There are two companies, Marvel and DC, that publish 70% of the comics in um, the comics industry. And so she is a professional artist with them, and that's the money that she makes. I'm not gonna say it's not enough, it's not enough for me, uh, and I know artists make more money than writers, as I am a writer, uh, so if she's making that much, and writers make less than that, the math may not add up for some people, so. Uh, a site called Fair Page Rates is running a creator survey until July, and already about 60 creators have responded. Uh, these people work for Marvel, they work for DC, they work for Dark Horse, Image, Oni Press, Lion Forge, uh, Boom Studio, so on and so forth. And they talked about all, all this stuff. So I looked at the writer thing, because I'm a writer and I want to get paid. <laughs> and the highest paid writers in, the comic, in, in, in comics make between $25 and $110 per page, okay? The average comic book is between 20 and 24 pages. Most of them are about 20 these days, but 22 is, is a, a, what I try to write for. Uh, this, of course, doesn't account for certain superstar writers. There's some writers that can command a higher page rate. You may have heard of them. Grant Morrison, Brian Michael Bendis, Matt Fraction. They may make more than this, but uh, it won't be like, thousand dollars a page it will be geometrically more than this so probably fewer than 30 writers in the entire industry have more than one book a month so that means that their 20 page book is all the money they're making from comics at 22 pages which is the old standard that means that they would make between five hundred fifty dollars and twenty four hundred and twenty dollars a month so if you don't want to get your calculator I did the math for that that means uh, the top the top ranked creator with one book has $29,000 a year. Before taxes, I didn't add taxes on that because I, I didn't have the information for what to do. Uh, and the bottom would be making 6600 Again, I don't live in India. You know, that might be enough for some places. I don't know. But it, in Los Angeles, it's not going to cut it. In San Francisco, it's not going to cut it. Even in Portland, it is not going to cut it. So. That is a, a factor to look at. I'm not trying to discourage you. I'm just giving you the numbers as they currently are. Okay? So, um, <laughs> people are asking, can I run out and make this money now? Can I right now just send in a letter to Marvel and start making this money? No. No, you can't. No. Marvel, Marvel's not interested in you. It's, I'm sorry. It's true. Uh, they're not, I, I have almost made a name for myself and Marvel's not interested in me. So, <laughs> uh, out of the 60 people in the survey, uh, and I, I focused on this because we're coming at the Black Art Comics Arts Festival, uh, only four people in the survey were black. I was one of them. I did not have a monthly book. So, uh, they did a survey that looked at all of the comics that come out through Diamond's catalog previews. Every month, comics retailers get a big, thick phone book called Previews, right? And they flip through it, and that's how they decide what they're going to order. What they order goes on shelves so you can buy it. You're not the real customer. The retail is the customer for the comic book companies. So, ah, that's a surprise. You're not really selling to people. People, to, oh, people can come in, hey, could you pull that book for me? And they can pre-order, but most don't. So the economics of it is that comic book companies and therefore comic book creators are selling to retailers, not to consumers. If you understand that dichotomy, then you understand, oh, the game is slightly different than the I may perceive it is. So, of the, the people in that phone book, the creators in that big phone book full of things, which had 400 pages worth of stuff, 2.4% of those creators were black. Not 2.4% of the artists, not 2.4% of the writers. 2.4% of all of the creators, counting writers and artists, were black. I'm gonna scroll back. So, <laughs> if only 2.4% of, of those people were making this theoretical, and I'm, I know they're not making the highest page rates, $25 or $110 a page, or uh, making $30,000 a year after taxes working 12,000, I'm sorry, 12 hours a day, then that's not a lot. Uh, 
there are currently, there, well, I'll get into how many uh, black creators are, are kind of at the top of the grade. The previous panel uh, had a gentleman named David Walker, who I've been very happy to know many years. He's in this picture, actually, that's funny. This is actually David Walker at the DC uh, Creative Retreat. DC and Marvel both have an annual meeting of all their writers, where they have them sit down and come up with story ideas for the next year and build upon things. And David was the only black guy at it. He was. Uh, <laughs> so, I, And this is the only picture I could find of David at it. So I <laughs> and I feel bad about that, but it's true. Um, so is it possible that you could be the next big name writer at a big two company? Uh, Scott Snyder, Matt Fraction, commanding these huge page rates and getting flown out to the retreats and winning awards. Is it possible? Absolutely. Is it probable, given the decades of, the, well, another fun number. In the entire history of comics, comics have been published roughly since the 1920s, 1930s. There's been 22 people, 22 black people, who have written more than one issue for either of the two big companies, 22. One of them was on stage right before I got here. For many, many years, those, uh, most of those books were written by two people, Dwayne McDuffie and Christopher Priest. And those are not good numbers, I'm sorry to say, but they're factual numbers. Again, I'm not trying to discourage you, I'm just giving you the lay of the land, because I'm not discouraged, I'm still making comics, and I'm gonna tell you why and how you can succeed. We're going somewhere with it, we're going somewhere with it. So, <clears throat> Uh, somebody's texting me, but I can't deal with that right now. Uh, <laughs> I'm so glad I turned on Wi-Fi on my computer. <laughs> Y'all see some crazy stuff. <laughs> okay, all right. So what does success look at? You have to think, for me, as a creator, whether you're black or not, because these numbers are not just, you know, there's a lot of white people that can't get hired in comics. I'm, it's true, you know. Really talented, really good white people can't get hired in comics. So you have to look at what does success look like? And how can you achieve it? So, a lot of people come up to me and like, Hannibal, look, the system is set up against me. The white man won't let me make my comics. Wah, 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 wah. That's not true. There's nobody white in your house stopping you from typing or drawing. There is not. If there is, you should call the police. <laughs> Just gonna put that out there. Because I've looked all through my house and there's no white people there trying to stop me from doing anything. So. Um, the system itself does have a number of financial structural elements that are set up to discourage, frankly, to discourage uh, people of color from participating. But the people who set up that machine are dead. They've been dead for a long time. We can't get them. We can't knock on their door and shake them down because they're gone. Uh, there's a, I'm gonna be honest with you. Just between you, just between us, okay. There's about 40 or 50 actual racist people in, it, in the industry. Right, about 40 or 50. You can avoid them, you really can. Because, you know, there's only 40 or 50 of them, you know? There's like a thousand people walking around a convention. You can avoid 40 or 50 people, if you work hard. But <laughs> what you have to look at is, what is your definition of success gonna be? What do you want to get out of comics? If you say, I wanna write Batman, well, that's a different story. You essentially gonna work, wanna work for somebody in their house with stuff that they own. That's not impossible, Christopher Priest has done it, Dwayne McDuffie has done it, but it's hard. Uh, if that's your definition of success, you have to know that's the hill that you want to climb. If your definition of success is, I want to tell my stories, I want to tell stories that reflect my life, my community, my experience, that's totally doable. You can totally do that. Now, notice I didn't say the word money in there. <laughs> you can make money at it. You might even make a living at it, maybe. But though that, that is going to change the incline of that hill from I'm telling my story to I need to make money to I need to be able to live off it. So again, not impossible, just different. You have to look at the work in a slightly different way. So, uh, oh, right, right. Uh, <laughs> I'm reluctant to go to this next slide because it's ignorant. But uh, it, uh, you can beat the system. It's possible. I, I, in certain ways, I have beaten the system. And uh, the next slide talks a little bit about how. There's a local philosopher named Todd Shaw. He's from the, the Bay Area here. And uh, the three things that you should, he's more commonly known as Too Short. He's a rapper. So <laughs> uh, there's three things you should know about him. 
First of all, he's a rampant misogynist. He's the worst. Never let your kids listen to him. Never let your daughters listen to him. He's the worst. I don't listen to him. He's awful. He supports ideas that I find morally and completely reprehensible. So I'm not advocating Todd Shaw. I'm not here to preach for him. I'm just relating that you can get wisdom from sometimes the worst possible places, okay? Second, he makes material for the lowest common denominator. If you want to go out and make stupid material, there are people who will buy it, you know? Uh, people always tell me, oh, well, you know, it, it's gotta be good, it made money. Britney Spears made money. Britney Spears can't sing. I have evidence of that. There's a, a, a video on YouTube of her uh, before they put these studio effects on her, and it, it sounds like somebody threw a cat against a wall. It's awful, right? <laughs> Things don't have to be good to make money. That's what America's all about. <laughs> <laughs> Too soon? Too much? Keep going? Okay. I don't, I, I don't know where to stop. I don't have any boundaries, I'm sorry. So anyway, the reason I, why I put him up is because as a business example, Todd Shaw is an amazing businessman. Before anybody knew who he was, driving around the streets of Oakland, he was selling a million records out of his trunk. I'm gonna say that again. A million records, each release out of his trunk. Now, if you sell a million of anything, you're going to make some money. You are, okay? Jive Records is a major label, and they came to him, and they're like, well, Todd, we want to sign you to a record co contract. We're going to put you on, we're going to release your records nationwide, and you're going to be great. He's like, no. Nobody says no to this deal. They're very used to people walking up and handing people a piece of paper and just signing it without even reading it. Nobody says no. He says, no. They're like, what? <laughs> He was like, if I'm already selling a million copies of this record out of my trunk and driving around and doing pretty much what I feel like, what can you give me? What, what, what could I do better? You know? Ah, uh, they didn't know what to tell him. So they restructured the deal. They gave him a higher royalty because in records and in comics and in print and lots of things, there's something called recouping. Right? Let's say they say, I'm going to give you a book deal. Here's $30,000, right? Ooh, I get an advance for $30,000. Great. But you didn't really get an advance, you got a loan. They expect that money to come out of the money your stuff makes until you pay it back. And you can't get paid any more money until you pay it back through selling material. Which means you better hold on to that 30, you better budget it well, because they expect you to fly all over the country and eat bad food and pimp that thing out to sell the book so they can make back their $30,000. Then after that, then they'll start paying you on a delayed schedule. That's really fun, but I'm not going to do a lot of details on that right now. Um, so they, they came back and they said, all right, we'll give you a bigger advance. No. We'll give you a bigger percent of your royalty. No. Multiple times they came to Oakland to discuss with this gentleman on the screen, and he said, no, no, no. Until finally, the deal that they, the deal that they finally gave him was so ridiculous. He got to own his own masters, which nobody gets. Well, definitely nobody got at the time. He got uh, control over the marketing. He got uh, final say over lots of things. He got to decide where the uh, marketing money would be spent. He got ridiculous control over the product. And he says, now I will let you people release my record. And he could do that because he had control. They kept coming to him. He didn't need them. He built something for himself. People that weren't interested in, oh, oh, he's doing a song about such and such, that's great. They were interested in him, so they came to him. And that is called building a brand. A lot of people talk about this, because I talk about him a lot, and they're like, you, you're just saying that because that's rap music. Rap is different, you get that on radio, you get that on TV. Has anybody done that in comics? Funny, you should ask. <laughs> As I mentioned, the gentleman who was on stage before, who you see on screen, is Mr. David Walker. Uh, he, he, for years and years and years, was doing a lot of crazy stuff which nobody ever thought would make any money. He did a zine called Bad A Mofo. There's kids in the room, so that's why I'm especially not trying to curse. I have two daughters, one's about her age. Um, so, uh, and it was about black exploitation and karate movies and, and cursing about politics. And I mean, it was really this random ranting thing. And he did it for years, and it was awesome. Uh, that he made a lot of good friends along the process because he's a super great dude, he's super prolific, he's super talented. And 
after making lots of novels and lots of movies and other stuff, and this is just him in Portland with a camera and a typewriter sometimes until he got a computer. And he finally was just churning out stuff, just making stuff. He finally made a book called Number 13. And the, it's on Dark Horse. And you can go down to his table out, out there and buy it. He's still got it on his table. And uh, they adapted it into a little video presentation, like a little teaser reel, right? And people from Hollywood came knocking on his door. Mr. Walker, Mr. Walker, we'd like to talk to you about a deal. We'd like to, we'd like to sign this. Mr. Walker, Mr. Walker. It wasn't just, oh, you know anymore. It was Mr. Walker suddenly because they were interested, right? After people from Hollywood started talking to him, DC Comics is like, who's this, who's this David Walker guy? Let's, let's, let's get him on the phone. What's he doing? And then he started writing a book called Cyborg. After that, Marvel's like, Mr. Walker! Mr. Walker! Mr. Walker! So next, it was, it's January, right? Yeah. Okay. So next month, <laughs> next month he's going to start uh, his book, Power Man and Iron Fist, comes out from Marvel Comics. So that high page rate, he's now making that high page rate. He wasn't making it when he was doing number 13. But now he's making the high page rate. Not because you know he sat knocking on Marvel's door, not because he sent in query letters day after day, not because I'm from Memphis. So uh, I grew up in the South, I grew up with a lot of that. So it, it, I apologize if the next metaphor is coarse. But he wasn't sitting on Massa's door, please Massa, let me work on your books, please. <laughs> no, that's, that's not David. That's no part of David. And it shouldn't be any part of you either. It shouldn't. <coughs> he was good enough to build something for himself, to build a brand for himself, to build a name for himself. And so are you. And so are you. And so are you. OK? So now, after working on himself, and th I'm not going to act like it didn't take him 20 years to do it, you know? <laughs> I started trying to break into comics in, the, in uh, 99 or 2000. And my first professional comic came out in 2014, I think. Oh, I only have 10 minutes left? I should talk faster. OK. So <laughs> um, the important thing is that he never gave up, and he kept finishing things. So all right, uh, now I'm going to talk to uh, We're talking to solutions now. I told you. I didn't want to discourage you. This is about the solutions. You held in there, and I appreciate this. So here's what you're going to do. Okay. There are a number of things that you can do to succeed. You can, you can find your definition of success, what are the stories that you want to tell and how you want to do them, and you can succeed. Even if it's writing Batman, even if it's writing Wolverine, I hope those aren't, because I think you can do better. I think better of you than that. I do. But <laughs> the first thing you can do is finish things. A lot of people come up and like, oh, you know, I got a novel sitting, but I've never really finished it. Then you're, you're not a novelist. You're a guy with a thing in the thing, you know. Finish it. You have to actually finish the work. Because if you're an artist and you always have something new to show, eventually you can collect that stuff into a sketchbook that you can sell at conventions and make money. Then you're not an amateur, you're a professional. And professionals have to be looked at a different way, don't they? Okay. If you're a writer, even if you're blogging, even if you put this stuff on the blogs, right? Even if they're ranting about stuff, you can collect those. Those are essays. You can sell those in a book that you can sell at a table and you're what is it? What are you? A professional, thank you. <laughs> so uh, creating product is the key to success in business. If you're not creating product, again, if it don't make dollars, it don't make sense. That's the ultimate underlying David Blake rule that we're trying to get to here. Uh, you have to be willing to give away stuff at first. This is awful. It will cost you money. You won't like it. You're going to be mad. You're going to be driving around with stuff in your trunk. And you're going to be carrying it to places. It's super annoying. But it's part of paying the dues. Because uh, for people of color especially, the incline may be a little more steep. You know, That's not anything against people who aren't people of color. You know, I'm not saying that they're taking. They're not, they're not in your house again. They're not stopping you from doing anything. It just means that's the reality of the market. Tom Brevoort at Marvel Comics said, you know, we sell comics to retailers who are 90% white, mostly. You know. They want to buy things that look like them. They're afraid of new things. They have businesses to support, support rather. So that's the reality of the business. We could spend uh, $20,000 marketing Blade and get 2,000 sales, or we could spend $20,000 marketing Wolverine and get 200,000 sales, which would you do? I'm not mad at him for that. That's business. He's building his brand. I have to build mine, right? So 
All right, uh, so you're gonna be giving away stuff uh, to people in conventions, to people who come out. Me, I don't have the ability to carry a lot of stuff because I have two kids and they like, you know, have a lot of stuff of their own. So <laughs> I, I give things away digitally. I'm like, if you send me, if you send me your email, I will send you a PDF of a, uh, a book that's going on. I'll send you a short story. I'll, I'll send you something. Cause also then I have their email address and I can bug them about other stuff. So but that's a marketing tip. Uh, so you have to be prepared to give away stuff. If you have it physically, that's probably better. To be honest, I'm not very good at it. But I've seen people better than me succeed with it. So uh, third, you have to improve at your craft, right? Um, when I was trying to break into comics at first, I wasn't as good as I am now. I wasn't as good a writer. I didn't know the things I know now. I didn't know things about structure. I didn't know how to set up a page and whatnot. I didn't know how to script. Um, I learned. I went out and I studied. I went to Dwayne McDuffie's website and read every script there. I went to Christopher Priest's website and read every script there. The Dark Horse sample script. Uh, anything I could get my hands on, right? I went and studied. Um, if you're not constantly improving yourself to get better, someone else is, and they're your competition, and they're gonna take the job you want. They're gonna take the sale you want, and you don't want that, you know. Uh, my mom, she's, uh, let's see, I'm gonna be 43 next week, so she's 63. Uh, she's like, son, I'm too old for all that. No, no you're not. There's a Publishers Weekly story about a guy who sold his first novel at 58. You know, it's not too late. Stan Lee created Spider-Man when he was 40. I'm sorry, no, was he 40 or 44? 44, thank you. So it's, it's never too late. It's not too late for me, it's not too late for you. You can keep going. All right, so you have to improve at your craft though because everybody else is and they will leave you behind. Don't try to cheap out, okay? You gotta have your own URL, you gotta have your own email address. You at yourdomain.com. Why? Because that's a sign that you're serious. You're not just somebody with a Gmail account who signed up for something for free who's not really gonna do something, okay? Uh, you have to keep your day job. I work at a healthcare company in Los Angeles during the day, working on their websites. When they're not watching me, when I go to the bathroom, I'm typing. <laughs> when I'm in a meeting, in a conference call, and they're blah, 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 I'm scripting panels because they can't tell what I'm doing. <laughs> Actually, I've told my boss that she knows. It's not even a secret. But <laughs> So uh, you're going to have to p keep your day job, and the reason why is because you're going to have to pay people to do things that you don't know how to do. I'm a writer. I can't draw. I'm terrible, terrible at drawing. So I have to pay people to draw. If I don't pay them, and I say, oh, well, we'll both get paid on the back end, maybe they'll finish it, maybe they won't. If I pay them, they're more likely to do it, and they're more likely to respect me. So you keep the day job so you can pay for stuff. If you have to barter with people, you have to do fair stuff. I work with an artist named uh, Jason Reeves, who's down here, and he wanted to work with something on me, but we both were short on money. So I was like, tell me what you want to do, and I will help you improve that. Then in return, you can do something for me. He was like, that's fair, right? We both are helping each other towards the things we want to do. Uh, that's the kind of barter that worked out sometimes. I've got, you know, Jason was great, my other partner Quinn is great, we have a creative studio, but it doesn't work for everybody, so I can good, say good luck with that one. You have to control your own narrative. I have five minutes? Cool. I really want to get to questions, but I'm trying to talk fast. OK. Uh, <laughs> I'll be around later if uh, it's not. And I'm online as Hannibal Taboo at Twitter, Instagram, and Tumblr if you have any more questions. But anyway, uh, you if you're not telling your story, if you're not putting out the material of what's happening with you, what's happening with you, what's happening with you, then somebody else is saying, oh, I know this guy. Uh, no, no, no. I, Thaddeus, no, no, Thaddeus isn't writing anything. He's, he's not very productive. Thaddeus writes like a billion words a day. He's amazing. This guy, his name is Thaddeus Howells. He's one of my favorite writers. He's crazy, though. He's, he turns out more copy than I ever could. Um, uh, you have to pick your own online name and stick to it. So, for example, I'm Hannibal Tabu. That's my name. That's also my DJ name. That's also what's on Twitter. That's also on Instagram. So if somebody wants to find me, it's not hard. You know, whereas... <laughs> I love David, right? But on Instagram, he's Mofo Man. On Twitter, he's David Walker 1201. And it, I'm all, I'm like, I can't tag you everywhere. That's annoying. So if you can't do that, you're making people work hard to find you, and that's not good. You want to look at websites for people who do the same kind of work that you do, and not be worse than them, which means you might have to pay somebody. Because again, they're your competition. They're going to take the job that you're not going to get. If somebody looks at your website like, oh, your site is booty, I'm not going to hire you. 
So um, you want to post regularly because that's how you build an audience. You have to keep people knowing that you're there because they will forget you. These fans are not loyal. They are not. They will, they will forget you. Uh, your first book that you're going to do is not going to be the best book. My first book was Artifacts 35 with uh, Image, and it's not the best book it could be. I admit that. I know that. Um, I've learned a lot since then. If I could go back and redo it, I would, but I can't. What I can do is make new stuff, right? The trick is, I paid them. I'm sorry, let me bring it. They paid me to learn how to write comics. Because <laughs> I won a contest. They run the, the Top Cow Talent Hunt every year. I won a contest, and they paid me for it. Malcolm Gladwell says it takes 10,000 hours to master something. The first part of that is going to suck. You're going to be awful. But you have to get through it. Keep churning out the work. Because if you're not churning out the work, you're really not getting it done. So uh, you know you can try to undercut people on raids. You can do whatever you want. You know, yada, yada, yada. Enter the Miller World Contest. Enter the Top Cow Talent Hunt. Try to get people to pay you. Because once you're a professional, it's a different story. It doesn't matter if you're 68. It doesn't matter if you're disabled. It matters if you can produce work. Can you churn it out? And that's what it all matters. Finally, and most importantly, don't give up. Because we need you out here. You personally, we need you out here, OK? So those are the things I, I've tried to do. Some of them I'm good at, some of them I'm not. Uh, do, I, do I have any time for questions? Yeah, you can do a couple questions. OK, we'll get to do a couple questions. And I'll try not to rant too long. Do we have any questions from the crowd? Yes, sir. Did you know that today is DJ Quick's birthday? I did not know today is DJ Quick's birthday. <laughs> That's fantastic. Thank you. That pretty much made my afternoon. All right. <laughs> All right. Do we have any other questions about process, about uh, the economics, about the business? Was that? Oh, yes, ma'am. What's the name of your comment? My. Oh, I've got several things. Uh, if you go to my site, HannibalTaboo.com, I've got uh, a book, well, I'm in Watson and Holmes Volume 2, which uh, comes out from New Paradigm Studios. I, that was December 10th that was released. I'm in Wasso Gathering Wind from Stranger Comics. That was December 8th. On next Wednesday, I have Executive Assistant Irish Sourcebook coming out from Aspen Comics. Uh, and I've got another Aspen Prose book coming out in May in conjunction with Free Comic Book Fact. And this is a number of, if you, if you look at my site, HannibalTaboo.com, or my Twitter, or Instagram, or Facebook, or Tumblr, uh, am I still on Plurk? I can't remember. Uh, or although, I'm literally ranting about this stuff all the time. So if you please follow me, and I'll be very grateful. Um, you can find out anything that you want uh, uh, there at, uh, yeah, let me go to, at HannibalTaboo.com. Yay. <laughs> all right. Yes, ma'am. Okay. But uh, are you making a lot of money? I'm not. Well, let me correct that. I'm making really good money altogether. I have a family of four. We live in Los Angeles in a two bedroom, two bedroom, two bathroom house, and I can support that. And I can come up here for this trip, pay it on my own dime. Okay. I have a day job though. Okay. I'm not making all that money just DJing at the county fair, which I do too, or or writing comics. You know, the money that I make writing comics is the money that I spent to come up here and do this trip. Okay. I'm gonna put it that way. Uh, that's today. That pretty much break even. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I haven't looked at how much I spend, honestly, because I don't want to. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I do know that the money that I made in 2015 was more than the money I made in 2014. Okay. And the money I'm on track to make in 2016 with the books that are already announced is more than that. So by the time my girls are in college, I can't say how much money I'm going to be making. But I'm going to bet that it'll be more. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. My ultimate goal, I want to be the black George Lucas, but I'll honestly sell for being the black John Scalzi. I'll, if I can make money writing and not leaving my house, that would ultimately be fine for me. Uh, but you know, in the meantime, I'm taking, my girls have health benefits, and I do what I have to do. So my ultimate goal is to be the black George Lucas, and I hope you'll see me there one day. Is that your passion, or just your goal? Your, your financial goal, or your? Oh, that's my financial goal. My, my creative goal, I'm already doing. I'm, I'm telling all the stories I want to tell right now. I'm doing everything I want to do right now, and that only gets better. So creatively, I'm already there. I'm good. I just have to keep getting better and not fall off. Yeah. yeah. Financial? That's a different story. That's a way different story. Well, sometimes the two intertwine, you kind of get, you know, but. Um, I, I hope they will. I wanted to know how serious you were. I'm 
deadly serious. Yeah. Any other questions or do are we good for Yes sir. Yeah, so you talked about how hard it is to live in certain places, right? With the low cost with a higher cost of living. Yes, sir. Is that actually important in comics? Like do you need to be living places where other people you're trying to make connections with live? Or can you actually just work from home when you get to your You don't need to, but it helps under certain circumstances. For example, there's a big comic book community that's developed in Kansas City. Kansas City's in the middle of nowhere in a state with bad education and bad government and all kinds of bad problems. But there's a really thriving community because there's a whole bunch of people there who started working and they didn't stop. They were like, I'm gonna make this comic and nobody's gonna stop me. They told their stories and they told them well and they improved and people started to listen. And now one of them, my friend John Nitz, he's got a character in the Suicide Squad movie. So, you know, you don't have to. What you have to do is you have to get out to conventions. You have to network. And that's on your dime. So, is it, which, which, which amount of money do you want to spend? I like, I like LA because it's warm, <laughs> you know, uh, and I'm close to a lot of people, and I could have driven here, but you know, uh, I took the mega bus and I rode all the way up, and I'm happy. So, uh, you don't have to live in New York or Oregon or California, but it doesn't hurt. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The look and feel so that you don't get you know, you're not just out there with a hard pocket and different things going on. Yes, sir. You talk about Lucas, I mean, how many years of consistency does he have? Yes, sir. So, I mean. The, the key there, and this is something that uh, a lot of people don't want to admit, the comics industry thinks that black comic creators are not as good. They think that our work is not as good, frankly. And I was the judge of the Glyph Awards for uh, Honest Con, which is the only black uh, award ceremony for comics. And I looked at the submission that came in. And frankly, they were right. 75% of the books that came in asking, this is nominated for an award, are terrible. Terrible, terrible. T copy editing, uh, bad graphics, bad storylines. You know, just things that I learned my freshman year at USC. Things I learned not to do, right? Uh, because the people who did it didn't improve their craft. You know, they threw anything out there and said, please reward me. And these are people who've been doing the same thing consistently and not improved over years, right? They, they didn't get my vote as a judge. They did not. And, and they are the people who you are, you, you have to spike. You have to prove that they are not the norm. And you have to do that by working harder. You have to outwork them, you have to outproduce them, and you have to just be better. And so do I, and I hope we both do. All, all done? All right, I'm being told I have to wrap it up. My name is Hannibal Taboo. You can find me at Hannibal Taboo.